Welcome back to the show. Barney is everyone's favorite purple dinosaur, right? Right? Well, maybe not. In a new book called No Dead Air, author Larry Rifkin reflects on his time as a TV exec working on Barney. He was already recently featured in the Peacock documentary, I Love You, You Hate Me. I have little sisters who are 16 and 20 years younger than me, so... Boy, oh boy, were we watching Barney when they were young. And we loved it, I just have to say. But it's interesting that 30 years after it originally debuted, it's been back in the news. Tell us about the two-part Barney documentary and the name of it. I love you, you hate me. What is this documentary all about? Well, Peacock and uh, folks at Scout Productions did this program. And what they wanted to do is to figure out why was it that something that was so successful, that was really a cultural phenomenon, had so many uh, concerns attached to it by many adults. Mm. Why was it that Barney fostered that kind of reaction from many adults? And, you know, it's really interesting, Amity, because those of us who worked on Barney, who brought it to television, mm -hmm. like myself, we weren't really focused on that issue. I knew that there was a lot of noise in the environment. Yeah. But what I was most concerned about was whether it was meeting the needs of the young people for whom it was intended. Yeah. And I've got to tell you, on that score, as you just pointed out with your uh, sister and brother, it really did. It was so perfectly developed for them. And I've got to credit Cheryl Leach and Kathy Parker and Dennis DeShazer, our partners in Barney, because they looked at the entire landscape of videos at the time back in the late 80s early 90s and they determined what it was that was missing what was really good that should be retained and then they built this wonderful character and wonderful environment for barney and friends yeah my mom used to joke she said when you were a kid we had a big yellow bird now we have a big purple dinosaur what is your take on the documentary <laughs> well i was in it my daughter was in it because I brought Barney to television through the eyes of my four-year-old daughter, who's now 36. And it was because I watched her watching Barney, brought the whole concept to PBS. We went into a competition and lo and behold, ultimately we prevailed. However, we were canceled in the midst of that. I thought that was a story they should have told about a lot of the internal politics within PBS that almost shut off Barney from the beginning, yeah. but they didn't deal with any of that. They dealt with certain things that were a little extraneous, at least to most of us who worked on the project. And then they dealt with people's personal lives. I was not terribly happy with the, the direction, mm -hmm. ultimately, okay. that the documentary took. Well, I mean, I, I think that's always hard too, right? When you were when you were such a close part of it. Can I ask you though? It was it was canceled right before it even really got going. How did it? How did we all end up seeing Barney then? Well, you know, if you see my book, No Dead Air: Career Reflections from the TV Executive Who Saved Barney the Dinosaur from Extinction. I mean, I've got to say, and they would credit me, my partners. I I, I really was most uh, uh, instrumental in that because. We could have accepted the decision. We went on the air April 6th, 1992. I got a call on May 29th, and I was told we will not be funding more episodes of Barney. 30, that's it. Now, we were in competition with Shining Time Station with Thomas the Tank Engine and Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop, and uh, they just didn't see what was happening in the culture, mm -hmm. where all of a sudden there was this tremor going on about Barney, but other programmers within the system saw it. So I brought Barney to Connecticut. We raised $50,000 one morning when normally, Amity, at that time, we would have raised two or $3,000. I brought him to the Hartford Civic Center for a little concert. And instead of being greeted by 100 or 600 people, there were 6,000 screaming children there. Oh, my and, gosh. And I shared that video with everyone in the system. I really ran a political campaign between the end of May and the end of June at the PBS annual meeting. And finally, at the end of the meeting, the uh, head of programming for PBS said, I'll be negotiating with Connecticut Public Television for more. Good for you. What a great story of perseverance. Can I ask, I know that it was, the kids loved him. What was it with adults that just liked to, to, 
give him such a hard time? Well, number one, I don't think people really ever thought about this, but I do put it in the book that I think we were the initial disruptor in many families. Mm. You know, a two or three year old or four year old accepts a lot of things that are going on with the older sibling in a family. Mm -hmm. Hand me down clothes, hand me down shows. So if they were watching Power Rangers by default because their older sibling was right. watching, they just accepted that. When Barney came along, that little kid, maybe for the first time ever, said, this is mine. And don't forget, this was not written on two levels like Sesame Street. Right. This was written to be appropriate for a very young child. And in fact, we skewed lower in age than they did. And you know what I said in the documentary that they really liked, so they kept it, was that Barney was Fred Rogers going electric. <laughs> if you recall Bob Dylan at Newport going electric. That, in effect, was what we did with Barney. It's a fascinating behind the scenes. All right, well,